to an end, and we're really, really um, glad that you guys came out and joined the students who are like, obligated to come because they made them come um, to uh, talk with me a little bit about this new project, uh, a book that's going to be coming out next month from Cinco Puntos Press called Fred the Serpent, Dark Heart of Sky, Myths of Mexico. It's the uh, culmination of many years of work and research and translation and just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff come in. There are plenty of chairs here in the middle. Um, and I just wanted to share with you guys the project, its genesis, the, the entire point behind doing something like this, um, and then walk you through the table of contents and, and some really cool images from the inside, and read excerpts to you. So the idea is for this thing to, to go until, um, I'll micro stage probably go until about 11.30, and then we'll open up for some questions, um, and we'll see how things go from there. And then at the end, I'm going to be giving away four copies of the advanced review advanced reader version of this book which is not it's like an uncorrected proof basically that we give out to reviewers and i've got some copies and so some people will, will walk away with a copy of that it's kind of fun right um, <laughs> i haven't given out tickets so i'm gonna have to like between now and then come up with some really inventive way to, to raffle them off we'll figure something out okay all right so uh my students know and my colleagues know, but those of you who don't, my name is David Bowles. I am an assistant professor here in the Literatures and Cultural Studies Department. I was a, a, a teacher and central office administrator for like a bazillion years before coming over here. Also teaching as an adjunct faculty member in the old UTPA English Department and Education Department. Um, so I mean, the other day I was taking an author on a tour of of the building where I am, E-Labs, which has like, had many different names, and Coas, Arhu, now it's E-Labs, right? And telling her, wow, I've spent 30 years in this building, 30 years in this building, and I'm getting lost. It's crazy, you know? It's, because you go in and you go to your office and you sit down and do your work, right? That's the way things are. Um, I have a very, very storied um, experience here at this university. It's an institution that means a lot to me. So, um, Part of the reason that it means a lot to me is that I am a Valley Knight. I am from the RGV. My, the two sides of my family, the Anglo-American side and the Mexican-American side, converged here about 100 years ago. Um, my one set of great-grandparents came across from Matamoros into the Valley. Another set came from another ranchito down into the Valley. This all like during the Great Depression, essentially. Um, while the, the Anglo-American side of my family came from like Oklahoma and Missouri, also fleeing some of the economic and um, agricultural issues. And they kind of converged, and they eventually commingled, and then boom, I, I popped, and here I am. <laughs> and, and growing up in uh, uh, this ethnically diverse family, most of my time was on the Mexican American side because I had like twelve cousins on that side of the family, and one cousin on the Anglo American side of the family, and he was like really boring. <laughs> he, just, he works in the technology department. Oh, Timothy Odoms. I don't know if you know him. Anyway, just, that's, he's a good guy. So I spent most of my time with the Mexican American side of my family, and growing up in that, you know, hearing the, the stories of my grandmother, Garza, all the folk tales of the borderlands from Las Lechuzas to La Llorona, La Mano Pachona, so if you, you grew up with a certain like cultural milieu, right? A, a, a certain attitude about storytelling and so forth. Um, and that storytelling is what got me interested in reading, and I learned to read before even at school. Um, and it set me on the path to be the first person in my family to go to college and a bunch of other things. So it was, it was a really great experience. But one of the tricky things about learning and education, especially in the 70s and 80s when I was going to school, um, for somebody of Mexican-American heritage is that it is both a blessing and a curse, if I could steal the words of Juno Diaz. He uh, recently gave the keynote at the American Booksellers Association. He talked about being uh, a Dominicano who you know immigrated to the U.S. and got interested in, in reading and found refuge in libraries like I did as a kid as well. And he calls him a blessing and a curse because it, on the one hand, it was opening his mind to new possibilities and, and putting him on a different path than he might have been on otherwise and, and being a sanctuary, but it was also systematically erasing him because all the literature he was reading had white protagonists, they were written by white people, and there was like very very little to no mention of his Latinx heritage, his Dominican heritage. And so the same sort of thing happened to me as I went through, you know, I went to Ben Milam Elementary in McAllen, and then um, Lincoln Junior High, and then I went off to uh, eventually graduate from PSA High School in 1988. And along that way, 
I didn't read anything written by Mexican American authors, or frankly by Latinx authors at all. There's plenty of seats. Just don't don't feel shy. Um, I think that when I was in elementary, the only book that I read that had any any semblance of a slight connection to my culture was the Ferdinand the Bull book, right? That's really sad. It's embarrassing, right? Ferdinand the Bull from Spain, written by a white guy. It's illustrated by a white guy. And that was it. And so when I got to college, and I think that a lot of people from my generation or older will be able to sympathize with this. When, when I got to college and read House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, yes. and I took a folklore class with Mark Glazer and started learning about you know, Aztec and Mayan mythology and so forth, I was at first kind of like surprised and shocked. Like, I, I mean, I loved mythology. I, I could name every Greek and Roman and Norse and Egyptian god. I didn't know this, the name of not one Aztec god or Mayan god. And I certainly had never read anything written by a Mexican American. And I, and I realized that even as I was getting all excited about being the first in my family to go to college and you know, being able to climb the ivory tower of academia and so forth, I had allowed this important part of myself to be like stolen. And so what happened was I decided that I was going to double down on the Mexican-American side of my family. Um, I like to say that it was like that moment in Star Wars. Remember the first Star Wars film where Obi-Wan Kenobi faces off against Darth Vader, right? And there's that, that incident where Obi-Wan lifts his lightsaber up and just stops fighting and he tells Darth Vader, you know, if you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. And that's the way I was like, you know, if you strike my heritage down, I will become más mexicano than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> so, and this, you know, it led me to, to start going down a rabbit hole, you know. I changed my minor from philosophy to Spanish and like really started digging down in the language that had been kind of, you know, systematically dismantled. I mean, I spoke Spanish, but as my wife <clears throat> laughingly called it, it was, you know, cultural Spanish. It was like the Spanish that a lot of us have, like, learn because we don't get to be educated in Spanish in the valley, especially in the 70s and 80s. And that led me into studying more about Mexican border folklore and then uh, colonial era uh, uh, folk tales and legends, which led me into pre-Columbian Mesoamerican mythology and religion and literature, which led me to study Nahuatl and learn the language of the Aztecs. Just, like this crazy, like this never-ending, it's like clicking links in a website, right? And then clicking a link in that link, and then link, and just down the rabbit hole, drilling, drilling down, until I finally like felt like I had recuperated enough of what had been lost in my life, and in the life of my father, and the life of my grandparents, and then going back generations, that I could then begin to give back. And so a lot of my work focuses on Mexican American community, Mexico, and these different things. So. This particular project uh, was um, a labor of love, like I said, about four years of work. And what I've done is I've taken the kind of fragmented myths of the Aztecs, the Maya, and to some extent taking a little bit from the like other people, like the Huicholes, the Tora people, the Tarumara, the Purepecha, the Zapotecos, all these different like indigenous groups in Mexico whose legends were almost kind of like wiped out during the conquest and just preserved piecemeal here and there. And I've tried to weave these bits and pieces together into like a single narrative that takes us kind of like on a tour of the mythological history of Mexico from creation all the way to conquest. So this is the book. And it's kind of dim, so I don't know how well you're going to be able to see the cover, but it's also right here. The Feathered Serpent, Dark Artist Guy, Myths of Mexico. And the, the wonderful cover and illustrations that you'll be seeing as I flip through the slides are by a, um, a, a pair of artists out of El Paso and Juarez that call themselves Los Dos. Um, they are a fantastic muralist and, and, and street artists, and so they bring this this really great flavor that bridges the, the uh, gap between our Mesoamerican past and the Mexican-American present, uh, because they're street artists and their sensibilities um, just e evoke who we are now while also trying to capture who our ancestors were. And I think it's like really, really cool. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through, the, I think there are seven different sections. I'm gonna like, show you the image, talk to you about what's in there, and like read a little bit from each one of those, if, if that sounds like a good idea to you guys. You're like, we're trapped in here, what do you want us to do? 
Do we get to vote? <laughs> Can we vote for you to read less? <laughs> so you'll see here the first section is the, the first three ages of the world. The book, um, I guess the, like the cornerstone or the, the, uh, the axis of the book is a conflict between two gods who are named in the title. Feathered Serpent, who is very known as Kukulkan, Quetzalcoatl, different names and different, um, and different indigenous nations, and his brother, who the Aztecs called Tezcatlipoca, but who was also called Hurricane and um, Heart of Sky by different Maya uh, peoples, and has um, analogs in, in different indigenous groups. And they are simultaneously brothers and opposite sides of the duality that sits at the heart of mythology in Mexico. And it's not, it's not a duality of good versus evil like we see in, in like European and Middle Eastern societies. It's a duality between creation and destruction, order and chaos. And there's a recognition that they both have to coexist. And that even though one may be ascendant over the other, there are periods of more destruction and periods of more creation, you can't eliminate one. Both of them have to coexist. But destruction can't exist without creation because what would there be to destroy? And creation cannot exist without destruction because what materials would it use in order to create? Every time we create, we don't create out of like nothing. We have to take something that exists and dismantle it in some way to create. And it's, it's like this really profound understanding of a reality of, of existence that I think is um, really cool. And under that uh, section, we've got three uh, different stories and a convocation. Now, each, each one of the sections of this book has a convocation because primarily, although I want everybody to read it, primarily I'm addressing the Mexican-American community and, and especially like young people. I'm thinking, you know, the teenagers who, like me, weren't able to have access to this, I want them to be able to read this. Uh, I want teachers to be able to use it and so forth. So the convocation is like, here I am, the storyteller, and I am convoking my, my gente. This is estoy convocando, que vengan y escuchen, right? Come together, let's talk. Listen to these stories that we have almost lost, and let's together, you know, find ways of celebrating the story. So what I want to do is I want to read for you the, the, the first convocation and then, like, the really brief um, beginning of Origins so you can get a feel for how this, this is put together. And like I said, I apologize for using these lights, but I am blind as a bat. <laughs> Look upon our beloved Mexico. The ancient singers gave her such lovely names. Navel of the moon, foundation of heaven, sea-ringed world. From jungle-thick peninsula and isthmus to misty highlands and hardy deserts, Mexico has cradled dozens of nations throughout the millennia, all worshiping the divine around them, shaping names and tales that echo one another while remaining distinct. If you listen close, you can hear the voices of our ancestors whispering down the long years in a hundred different tongues, urging us never to forget where we came from, how Mexico came to be, the price they paid to make us who we are. Can you hear that ancient chorus chanting to the rhythm of the wooden drum accompanied by the throaty shrill of the conch? That is the flower song, the holy hymn. Listen closely, sisters and brothers. Catch snatches of the melody. Let us sing the old thoughts with new words. Can you see the looms of our grandmothers shuttling out colors, the weft and woof of so many tribes? They unfurl through the ages, frayed or unraveled by time and conquest, like well-worn rainbow rebosos. Take up the threads, each of you, and weave with me the multi-hued fabric of our history, from the obsidian darkness of the void to the flash of foreign steel upon these shores. We start at the beginning, and this is the, the, uh, the first retelling, it's Origins, and the first section of Origins is called The Dual God. And that's the God that's um, on the cover of the book. You see this uh, dual entity, both male and female, on the, on the front of the cover. That's the dual God, the source of everything. There was never nothing. Before 
you or I or anything else existed, the universe was filled with the mysterious vital force we call ku or teatu. Still and calm, this divine energy stirred slow, hushed murmurs spreading and languid ripples across the immeasurable expanse. Then, at the very heart of the cosmos, the force compressed, coalescing into a powerful being of two complementary halves, what we might call male and female. This dual god, Omedeatl in the Nahuatl tongue, the ancients lovingly called our grandparents. Omedeatl began to dream and speak to itself about these dreams, describing a vast world and multi-tiered sky, people with creatures so diverse and wonderful that the very thought of them brought joy to our grandparents' hearts. And there, in that primal place of authority at the center of everything, Omedeatl understood that it could be a mirror in which those dreams would be reflected, from which they would emerge into existence. Though still one, its two halves became more distinct. For this reason, we give them both many names, Builder and Molder, Lord and Lady of the Two, Goddess and God who sustain us, Matchmaker and Midwife, Grandmother and Grandfather. They pulled the vital force in two directions, molding it to form the vast cosmic sea below and the empty heavens above. From the very depth of the eternal waters, our grandparents drew a massive leviathan, Sipatli. With its knobby skin and razor-sharp teeth, the beast prowled the sea, a frightening mixture of reptile, amphibian, and fish. Always hungry, Sipatli would not remain still, but kept diving in search of food. Our grandparents, who had hoped to build a world atop the monster's back, understood that creation was a more complex task than they had imagined. They would need help to finish their work. And the section goes on then to show how they unfold themselves into the first sets of gods. Um, Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca for the serpent and heart of sky. And then also their female counterparts, the, protect, the, the protectress and the divine mother, who are then kind of like the origins of all, all the rest of the, the multiple gods that are involved in the creation of the earth. Um, and this section goes on to talk about how the heavens and the underworld are created, the first three ages of the world as well. And then the book moves to the fourth age. Now the fourth age is one that we actually have an abundance of information about because the, the Maya of Guatemala, the Quiche Maya, preserved this story through the conquest, writing it down, using, you know, stealing the, the Spanish um, writing system, stealing the Roman alphabet, and writing down the old words that have been preserved in, you know, codices with Maya glyphs that had been burned by you know, Spanish conquistadores. And that came down to us, and today we know it as a Popol Vuh, right? And the Popol Vuh echoes a lot of the same stories that were told throughout the, the, the area that called the Maya, the, the area in which all the different Maya nations lived. Because frankly, saying Maya is kind of like saying European, right? So you, you have the Yucatecos and, and the Quiche and, and like tons of other groups. And the Popol Vuh, the, the main story in it is the story of the Hero Twins, um, which is probably one of the greatest stories ever told, one of the most amusing, most um, adventure-filled, exciting, and like uplifting stories ever about these two um, demigods, brothers, who descend into the underworld to kind of right a wrong that was done to their to their, their fathers before them, and they are able to defeat the lords of Shibata, the, the place of darkness, the underworld. Okay. This is their mother, um, Lady Blood. She was a, the, the daughter of one of the lords of the underworld, who is there receiving from the head of their father his essence, which then makes her pregnant in a kind of like virgin birth, which is something that we see repeatedly in Mesoamerican um, folk. So what I want to do, I just want to read a little part of their story that uh, shows when they first descend into the underworld, uh, because their fathers were gone, they were killed, they were tricked by the lords of the underworld and killed, and the head of their father was like hung on a tree, like a, a, as a calabash, as a calabasa pumpkin, right? So I'm going to just read the part where they they get past the very first trick that the Lords of Shiva Ban try to play on. Okay. 
Then the brothers came to the crossroads, but their mother, Lady Blood, had taught them about the roads, black, white, red, and green. Kunapu, that's one of them, Kunapu and, and Shabalante are the two different brothers. Kunapu plucked a hair from his knee and with a whispered spell, transformed it into an insect he called Mosquito, the perfect spot. Go, little guy, bite each of them in turn until you've tasted them all. Then, forever, the blood of travelers will be yours. Good, said the mosquito, and it flew off down the black road. When it reached the council chambers, it alighted first on the wooden statue that had been dressed up to resemble the king and queen, because this is how they tricked their fathers the first time, by, by using statues instead of the, the, real, the real creatures. It bit the first, but got no response. The second said nothing either. Next, it bit the third one, the real king of death. Ow, he cried. What, your majesty, asked the dark lords. What is it? Something stung me. The queen looked at it. It's merely an ow. What, my queen, asked the king, what is it? Well, something stung me. Ow, cried the fifth one seated there. What feeling scab, asked the queen, what is it? Something stung me, majesty. Then the sixth one was bit. Ow, what blood gatherer, asked peeling scab. Don't you love their names? <laughs> <laughs> if you're a lord of the underworld, you're going to have an awesome name, like peeling scab. <laughs> something stung me. And thus went mosquito to every dark lord, biting him or her to learn the face and name of each. Pus demon, jaundice demon, Foam scepter, skull scepter, wing, pack strap, bloody teeth, bloody claws. Shabalanke and Munapu, meanwhile, had been approaching down the green road, the only one living being should travel. As the mosquito heard the Dark Lord's names, so did Munapu, who shared them with his twin. Finally, the brothers reached the council chambers. Greet the king and queen of death seated here before you, the Dark Lords commanded. Uh, no, those aren't the king and queen. They're just statues, said the twins. They turned to the rest and greeted them by name. Morning, King of Death. Morning, Queen of Death. Morning, Peeling Scab. Morning, Blood Gatherer. Morning, Puss Demon. Morning, Jaundice Demon. Morning, Bone Scepter. Morning, Skull Scepter. Morning, Wing. Morning, Pack Strap. Morning, Bloody Teeth. Morning, Bloody Claws. And the Dark Lords were taken quite by surprise. Greetings to you as well. Um, have a seat on that bench, directed the King. The twins were not defeated by this ruse. Uh, that's no bench, Your Majesty, Shabalanke replied. It's just a heated stone. Well done. Um, your journey has been long. You require rest before our game. You may enter yonder house now. The brothers headed toward Darkness House, the first of the torments in the realm of fright. The Dark Lords felt certain that these two would be defeated there, so they sent a messenger with a torch and two cigars. Take these and light them, he instructed. Our king bids you to bring them back to him in the morning intact. Will do, the twins replied, but they did not light the torch. Instead, they substituted consuming flame with the tail feather of a macaw that shimmered with magic. The night sentry saw it and believed the torch lit. In the same fashion, the brothers caught fireflies and sent them dancing at the tips of their cigars. So Darkness House was all aglow all night long. Oh, we have beaten them, exulted the sentries. Yet in the morning, when the brothers went before the council, the torch had no mark of fire, and the cigars were whole. Then the lords consulted together. What sort of beings are they? Whence did they come? Who sired them? Who gave them birth? Our hearts are deeply troubled, for they will do no good unto us. Their appearance, their very essence, is wholly unique. The king and queen confronted Munapu and Chabalanke. Tell us truly, whence do you come? Well, we must have come from somewhere, but we just don't know. They would say nothing. And so, bit by bit, they defeat the Dark Lords at every single one of their attempts at, you know, causing their deaths until, in the very end, they're able to defeat the Dark Lords by using their own, their own ruses against them. It's, it's a lot of fun, a great story. Um, for those of you who, who like quest stories, um, it is definitely one of the best quest stories ever. Um, and one that I stole from extensively when I did my, my first, the first book of my Gasha Twin series, uh, the smoking mirror because they descend into the underworld and they're twins and they look all stuff and I'm like, okay, yeah, what would what would Kunapu and Shabalanke do? And that's basically what I kind of have them do. The next section is called the Fifth Age and the Reign of Demigods, and here we have Siwakoatl um, grinding up the bones of the previous iteration of humanity to make us to the, to the people who live in the, the world today under the fifth sun. Um, and just, isn't that like a really evocative art that Los Dos did such a fantastic job? So happy that we were able to collaborate on this. 
So there are a bunch of different things in this section, the creation of human beings that I'll read to you right now. Um, and then there's stuff about the creation of the fifth son. This is um, one of the, the, uh, the myths that I used to use all the time when I taught in middle school, uh, because it's, it's the one where the gods have to like sacrifice themselves, and are, like you have the old god who becomes the sun, and the younger god who becomes the moon, and the rabbit is thrown to, put, to dampen the light of the moon. So that's a great story. Um, and then there are some other, uh, like I bring in a, a, a story from the Korah people. The, the Korah are, are a, uh, a group of people living in um, the mountains of northern Mexico, kind of related to the Micholes and the Tarumana a little bit. They speak a language that's uh, a, a Yucho Aztec language related to Nahuatl. And, and some other uh, things, including the birth of Huitzil Apoche, which is an awesome story, and the Archer of the Sun, where a, uh, a, an archer from the coast of Mexico duels with the sun. It's great, great stories. Uh, I think are fantastic. But I want to read the one about creation of human beings because it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, the fourth age had come to an end. The gods, saddened at the destruction of the earth, gathered in Teotihuacan. The sea ring world emerges. The heavens have been restored. But who will sing us songs? Who will worship us? Who will keep the cosmic wheels turning? Feathered serpent turned to divine mother. We must, must, we must once more strive to make human beings. Let this new attempt combine all the strengths of the previous. To do so, she told him, we will need the bones of those who have died. Hurricane smiled. Brother, if you want them, you will have to descend to the land of the dead and petition the king and queen of that fell domain. So be it, feathered serpent declared, departing. He came to the river at the edge of the underworld, which the dead can only cross on the back of a hound. Twinning himself so that his Nawali stood before him, he addressed that hairless spirit dog. Shorotl, double of my heart, bear me across my broad Apanawayan so that on its farther shore I may seek the bones of the dead. Gladly, my plumed master, seize the folds of flesh upon my back, and I will swim you to your destination. And so all dogs, buried with their owners for this purpose, are called Shorotl Squintle, to honor the Nawali of Feathered Serpent. With Sholoto's aid, the creator god easily navigated the next eight obstacles and stood before the king and queen of death in their eldritch, windowless palace at the heart of the underworld. What brings you to our realm now, after so many years, O feathered serpent? asked the king, his eyes like pinpricks of fire and the black orbs of the skull framed by his owl plume headdress. The god Stilma and Brichka were spattered with blood, and round his neck he wore a chain of human eyeballs. Yeah, because you stand before him and you're supposed to be like, any last connection that you have to your earthly life and your family, whatever, is supposed to dissolve in fear when you see this dude setting for you. So like, okay, I'm, in, I'm ready to move on to paradise. You've scared the humanity out of me completely. <laughs> this did not occur in Coco, by the way. Just, just saying. I mean, it's great we would, they didn't show this guy in Coco. I have come to take the precious bones that you have guarded with such diligence. What will you do with them, Lord Creator, asked the queen. The gods in Damwanchat need humans to ease their sadness. With these remains, I will fashion a new race of men and women to praise and honor us. They will be mortal, so their bones will return to your hands, as will the bones of their children, and their children's children, as long as this fifth age shall last. Very well, replied the king. First, however, as a sign of honor, take this my conch and travel four times round my realm, sounding an exultant call as you go. Feathered Serpent agreed, but as he prepared to sound the shell trumpet, he realized the conch had no hole for blowing. See, these, these tricky underworld gods, man, they're always messing with you, no matter what you do. Summoning worms, he had them burrow in the apex of the spire and smooth its hollow interior. Then he had bees and hornets fly inside, adding their distinctive buzz to the air he sent rushing through the walls of the conch. The resulting call could be heard in every corner of the underworld, even in the very throne room of Lord and Lady Death. After his fourth circuit of the land of the dead, Feathered Serpent made his way back to its center and stood once more before the sovereign of the realm. Very well, take the bones, growled the King of Death. Once Feathered Serpent had departed the palace to collect the bones, however, the skeletal god called together his council, the lords of that frightful realm, the ones that had been defeated by Hunaku and Shabalaki earlier. Go after that flume snake, my vassals, and tell him that uh, I've changed my mind. He must leave at once, without the bones. The ghastly messengers caught up to the creator god and repeated their sovereign's command. Feathered Serpent reluctantly agreed. I will leave them. Tell your king and queen. 
the lords of the, un of the netherworld watched him fly off, heading out of the land of the dead by the eastern route the sun once took to emerge at dawn each day. They themselves traveled back to the eerie castle to inform their masters, but they were deceived. Earlier, when Feathered Serpent had heard in his heart the command of the king of death, he had told Sholoto, his twin, his Nawa, I must take these bones forever. I need you to change shapes with me. Having assumed my form, you will agree to the king's wishes. Once you and the messengers have gone, I will steal the remains and flee. So it was that he emerged from a place of hiding in the form of his Nawali, gathered the bones of men and women, wrapped them in a bundle, then rushed like the wind to avoid detection. The god of death became aware of the ruse, however, and he called again to his council, Lords, Feathered Serpent is at this very moment stealing the precious bones. Use all haste to cut him off before he emerges in the sea ring world. Dig a pit into which he will fall and be trapped. Using hidden routes known only to the, Lord, the rulers of the realm of fright, the Dreadlords raced ahead of Feathered Serpent and fashioned a vast and cunningly disguised pit. The Creator God, startled by a cubby of quail that swirled around him on the king's command, tumbled into the trap, smashing the bones into smaller bits. Chewing away the birds, which had begun pecking and nibbling at the fragments, Feathered Serpent gathered up the remains and assumed once more his true form. Ha, ah, Sholoto, how was I so easily deceived? None of them is whole. The twin of his heart answered from within, all is as it must be. The bones have been shattered, but they will have to suffice. Feathered Serpent seized the bundle and ascended to Tamwancha. He placed the bones in the protector's hands, crying out, Divine Mother, the bones are broken. What can we do? The Divine Mother smiled. All must be broken before it is made whole. We will now ground the remains into powder, my sister and I. Then all of us must do the proper penance to moisten the bone flour so it can be kneaded and shaped. When the Divine Mother and the Protector had used metate and mano to pulverize the bones, Feathered Serpent pierced his flesh and bled into the flour. Then each of the gods in turn did the same. The resulting dough was shaped into men and women who were brought to life by the spirits wending their way down from Omeyoka, sent by our grandparents to inhabit the sturdy new forms. But the serpent bowed his head as the humans opened their eyes. Thus is our hope born. We did penance to ensure their existence. Now they will be, do penance to preserve ours. And this is one of the multiple reasons that the people of pre-Columbian Mesoamerica believed in bloodletting because they believed that gods spilled their blood again and again to save the world, to create humanity, to set the sun into motion, and that it was our duty as well to spill our own blood. And among the Maya, that meant you know, piercing your, your flesh and letting drops fall out into the fire and things like that. And it was only over time that this built up into the type of like larger human sacrifices that you saw towards the end of the quote-unquote Aztec Empire, the Triple Alliance of the Nahua. <clears throat> Next, we move into the section about the Toltecs. So the, the Tolteca were um, a Nahua-speaking people that preceded the, um, the Aztecs. They, um, it's kind of imagined like the Romans inheriting like Greek civilization and so forth. So the, the, the Nahua people that came Latin later that we now call Aztecs inherited Toltecs' beliefs and, and, and so forth. And one of the most important stories of the Toltecs is the story of um, Se Acapel Quetzalcoatl, who is like the human incarnation of the feathered serpent. Um, and it is a myth that is that is very, very similar to like the story of Jesus Christ, and it made it, I think, a little bit easier for Catholic priests to sell indigenous peoples, especially indigenous people of central Mexico, on the idea of Christ, you know, and his story and so forth. They were like Sounds like it's like to us. The Toltecs believed in him, so yeah, I guess we're down to that. It's a little more complicated than that, but I'm so funny. <laughs> um, one of the things that I learned, and you may have heard the story of Quetzalcoatl, how he's, he's king of Tolano Tula, and how he forbids human sacrifice and runs the, the priests out of, of the city who were engaged in human sacrifice. And they began to plot against him. And one of these priests is named Tezcatlipoca, and he is the human incarnation of Quetzalcoatl's brother. And so that, that rivalry that is, has existed in the heavens is now being played out in human form on Earth. 
And you probably have heard the story of Quetzalcoatl seeing his reflection in the mirror and then getting drunk. And then there's like this horrible, horrible story that says that he then had sex with his sister. But there is nothing, like literally nothing, when you read the original text to suggest that brother and sister had an incestuous relationship at all. It's a complete misinterpretation from people who are like deliberately trying to misunderstand. Quetzalcoatl and his sister Quetzalpetlatl were devotees of certain gods, and they would get up every morning, like before the sun rose, and they would go down to the river, and they would worship, and ritually bathe, and do ritual bloodletting, and they were, you know, it was important, and every morning they did it. And so, it is their, um, their abandoning of, the, of that daily routine, because they get drunk, that embarrasses them so much that they feel they have to abandon the, the city of Tulan. And, and leave it in the hands of, of Tezcatlipoca and his priest. Um, and the story goes on to talk about how after that, um, Quetzalcoatl, recognizing that he is a god made flesh, begins to travel throughout Mexico, and he teaches all these different um, nations, um, agriculture, how to plant, uh, how to do the, the special type of um, crops that, that you see in a lot of the meat bus up to this day where you have corn planted with beans and, and all and, um, different types of squash all together in one field so that the plants support each other and, and are really, really healthy. And then he ends up going among the Maya and, and, and helping to found Chichen Itza and stuff like that. So it's a sweeping, vast story. And I didn't even know like what to choose from it, so I didn't choose any part of it because just to pull a part out of it would be like really, really tough. But at the very, very end, he he sets himself on fire on, on, the, the, on the beach, and his heart rises up into the sky, and it becomes the morning star, Venus. It's just an amazing, amazing story um, of redemption, but with a Mesoamerican twist. It's a really, really great story. <clears throat> Because at this point in, in the book, we've seen Quetzalcoatl go to the Maya, to, the, to what we call the Yucatan Peninsula, and, and interact with these different Maya, the next section is a collection of tales of the Maya people. You'll note that I say Maya and not Mayans. It's not considered like kosher to say Mayans. Just, we all we learn new things every day, right? So here's, this is your informative lesson of the day. Mayan is the language. They, they, they speak Mayan, but they are Maya, and it doesn't have a plural, and, and there's no... The adjective form for the people is also Maya, Maya culture, Maya religion, or whatever. Mayan is only for the language. You learn something new every day, right? Because I don't want you to like, the, suddenly, you know, say the wrong term to one and have them go, dude, really? I'm not a Mayan, I'm a Maya, come on. I'm the program. The stories in this one range, they're a little more legendary, and there are a couple of really, really great stories um, that center on women. One of them is Asakni Te and the Fall of Chichen Itza, uh, about a, a princess who leads her people out of the, the, the destruction of the city of Chichen Itza. And then there's a the tale of Shtabai. Now, uh, today, Shtabai is considered um, this kind of like evil figure, like a Yorona or something like that, down in the Yucatan, who seduces men and you know, tricks them into their death. But the story behind that is so, so powerful and, and, uh, and speaks to the very advanced way of thinking of, of femininity and womanhood and maternity and so forth that the Maya had compared even to, to, to modern day Americans that I thought I would share it with you. So let me tell me what time it is because I don't have my phone with me. What time is it? 11, okay, good, right on schedule. Some of you are like, oh really? Because it feels like you're taking forever. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you the tale of Shtabai. It's, I think it's really, really powerful and moving. As the last kingdoms of the Maya fell, people moved to smaller villages. These were nestled among the wooded hills near the empty cities that nature had already begun to reclaim. Here the people lived simple lives in obedience to the gods, tending to their mipas and families with care. The families can be so very diverse even in the smallest, most united of communities. And those who do not conform to their assigned social roles often come in conflict with those who do. In one village of the northern Maya lowlands, two girls were born 
who would forever be remembered for the lessons their differences teach us. Shtabai, a hunter's daughter, was named in honor of the noose-wielding goddess of the hunt. A free spirit from an early age, she was encouraged by her family to be loving toward all and generous and giving of herself. For Shtabai, this generosity would come to include her very flesh. She was devoted to the protector in her aspect of Ishtel, midwife and fertility goddess. And she learned from the priestesses that her body could be a tool of worship and fellowship. Her many lovers regaled her with jewels and feathers, costly blouses and skirts. Shtabai enjoyed these gifts for a time, but she invariably gave them away to women less fortunate than she, or sold them to help the poor and infirm. Despite the attention she received from men of power, she remained humble and simple, never looking down her nose at others, treating everyone with dignity and respect. Yet Shtabai was despised all the same. The name of her nemesis has been lost to us. Likely she was called as a child by her day sign, as was the custom in those times. But after years of piety, of rectitude, of virginal purity, she earned herself the moniker Utskolel, virtuous woman. Ironically, Utskolel, while superficial, superficially chaste and good, harbored evil of every kind in her heart. She despised the people in her town, saw those in poverty and sickness as beneath her, envied the good fortune of those above her. Cold and proud, she could not stand to hear her neighbors extol the virtues of Shtabai. She is well named, Utskolel observed. She ensnares men with her wiles like the goddess does her forest prey. Still, there is something sacrilegious about her bearing such a holy name. Better we should call her Shkeban, for she is indeed a shameless tart. <laughs> My sisters, how long will you continue to allow her to frolic sinfully with your brothers and husbands and fathers? When will you see past her sweet facade to the rot that lies within? She began a campaign of lies and character destruction. One by one, the women of the village were swayed by the attacks of Utskolel. Shtabai made no public outcry, leaving her fate in the hands of the gods. Instead, she continued to live her life as she believed she should. Her ongoing charity kept the poorest members of her community loyal to her. Still, most people turned on her, convinced that an upstanding woman like Utskolel must be trusted. Gradually, Shtabai's name faded, replaced by the hurtful epithet, until even the leaders of the village referred to her as Shkaban. Her once gentle lovers were cruel and rough, withholding further gifts. Saddened but undaunted, Shtabai began to spend her days in the wild, finding comfort in the bounty of the earth, plants and animals that did not judge, that accepted her as part and parcel of the sprawl of creation. Her nights she spent alone in her humble knot sleeping peacefully despite the ill will of her neighbors. One day, Shtabai did not emerge from her house. No one saw her slip the margins of the town to walk along the Sebas, calling to the Quetzales and hummingbirds, as was her custom. Days passed. Her absence was ignored at first, but it soon troubled the minds of those loyal to her. Gradually, a lovely and delicate scent began to spread throughout the village, like flowers shaken off from the depths of heaven itself. Searching for its source, a crowd found itself thronging before the entrance to Shtabai's abode. Inside, they found her lifeless body, uncorrupted and beautiful. Lies, snarled Utskolel when she heard this news, or at the very least, black magic. Impossible that a woman so marred by sin could naturally smell so sweet. It's her vile spirit, rejected by the underworld, lingering on earth to inveigle men once more. Ah, imagine, sisters, if the corpse of such a, a tart can release this perfume, when I die, the aroma will be utterly divine. Somber and filled with pity, a handful of family members and friends buried Shtabai, knowing this to be their obligation. The next day, inexplicably, the grave was crisscrossed by vines bearing delicate white blossoms whose enticing scent had attracted hundreds of bees. Shtabetun that species of morning glory was called snake plant. Honey from those flowers had been used for centuries to ferment a mead as intoxicating as the passionate love of Shtabai herself. The message of the gods seemed clear. The villagers, the villagers regretted their awful treatment of the lovely soul that had now slipped forever beyond. Not Utskolel, of course. 
Growing more and more bitter at her rival's miraculous end, the pious woman withdrew from the world, dedicating herself to sanctimonious bloodletting and exhausting prayer, working to outdo Stavai's renewed reputation for blamelessness. Her heart curdled with hate, and her cold beauty wasted to nothing. One day, her mother found her dead, sprawled on the floor of her room. There was much public outpouring of grief at the news of her passing. Her family plunged into mourning as it prepared her body for its journey to Shibaba, placing maize and jade in her mouth as food and currency, laying carved whistles in her hands to help her find her way, wrapping her flesh with a cotton mantle, and then sprinkling the bundle with holy cinnabar. The entire village attended her funeral. The priest openly wept at the loss of such an exemplary woman. There was talk of building a shrine above her tomb. People spoke until very late about her many virtues, though a few whispered ugly truths about Utskolel that had emerged over the years. In the depth of the night, a rotten stench began to float along the, in, the, in, the limestone streets. The next morning, all were shocked to find the grave of Utskolel covered with a patch of brutally spiny cactus known as Sakam. The normally odorless blood-red petals nestled amid the thorns now curdled the air like putrid human flesh. Again, it appeared the gods had rendered judgment. Sensing the shocked comments of her community, the soul of Utskolel strayed from the path to Shibalba, lingering furious near her grave. Envious beyond words of her rival, even in death, the twisted revenant reached a foolish conclusion. Shtabai's sins of passion had somehow brought her rewards in the afterlife, so Utskolel would have to imitate her to escape the miasma of corruption that enveloped her soul. So it was that, aided by dark forces that rejoice in chaos, Utskolel took up residence in an ancient Seba tree, right? And learned how to return to the physical world at whim, assuming the form and name of Shtabai. Drunken men stumble across her deep in the wood, combing her long black hair with cactus spines. She calls them, that's the music that she sings to. <laughs> she calls to them, seduces them, hungry for the pleasures that she mocked and condemned when alive. The man who approaches her is lost forever. When his townsfolk or family search for him, they will discover his corpse, abandoned amid the sable's gnarled roots, his flesh gnashed by fingernails, I mean gashed by fingernails and a sack of needles, his chest ripped open, his heart devoured. Lingering on the air is a strange scent, sweet at first, but quickly fading into rot. So I think it's a fantastic story about like how we judge women who live their lives on their own terms and how heaven and gods and all that's good and right in the universe may be smile on, smiling on them without our knowing. Great story. You know, often when you think of Mesoamerica, you think of like male-oriented stories, but there are tons and tons of stories centered on women. The next section is Aztec's descendant, and this focuses on, you know, we begin to move into actual history now, although it's history that was, for a, a lot of times, like, you know, it comes to us in fragments because of all the codices that were destroyed and, and so forth, but we get Another convocation, then we get the, next, the Mexica Exodus. Uh, we get a story from, um, from Michoacan, Abunda the Lake. And then we get the famous story of the volcanoes. You guys know the story of uh, the two volcanoes in Mexico, Popocatepetl and Ixtaxihuatl, right? That are um, thought to be the, the form of a woman, a princess who, who died, and her warrior lover who bore her up into the mountains, and they were transformed into volcanoes. Um, then we get the story of the founding of Tenochtitlan, um, as the Mexica finally make their way to, to the island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. And then um, we get the story of Tlacael. Now, during the, the creation of what we now call the Aztec Empire, the Triple Alliance, there was one man who basically was behind every single king for like the majority of that first century of its existence. And he died when he was like 90 years old. And that's Tlacaelen. He was brother to the first uh, Motecusoma, or who I would now say Montezuma. His name is Motecusoma. And uh, Tlacaelen was basically, he's basically the architect of the modern Mexica because they were basically like this nomad tribe, the very last tribe to, to leave Aztlan 
Um, and they were disrespected by all the other Navas. They hired themselves out as mercenaries. They were treated really badly. And under Flacaelli's guidance, they rose to ascendancy in central Mexico and basically created the largest empire that Mexico has ever known. Larger than the Olmecs, larger than the Toltecs, enormous. So towards the end of Flacaelli's life, never he never was king. Towards the very end, he was offered the kingship. And I just want to read this really brief part that shows you the kind of guy he was. He's just going to feel kind of arrogant, but like brilliant at the same time. Um, after nearly 30 years in power, Moctezuma Yucamina had expanded as the first Moctezuma, not the second, the one who's with Cortez, had expanded the alliance's territory all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. When he died, his people adored him and his enemies feared him. Flaca Elel guided the leaders of Tenochtitlan to select the son of Moctezuma, 19 year old Achayacatl, uh, as king. The youth ruled for 13 years, this uncle continuing as Siwakoatl, which was advisor. So cool that the, 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 the title for advisor, Siwakuatl, means snake woman. That was the name of the advisor to the king. He was called the snake woman. Because, like the Mexica knew, you want an advisor, he needs to think like a woman. Right? So that was pretty awesome. <laughs> he needs to have the, the intelligence of a woman. Da, 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 da. His reign was successful in some respects. He put down the rebellion of Tlatelolco and made that sister city a permanent part of Tenochtitlan. But his campaign against the Purépecha was a failure, as were many other of his military endeavors. By the time of his death in 1481, the alliance was rife with plots and striving factions. Tisok, the brother of Ashadyakapi, inherited a fractious empire fraying at the edges. His disastrous coronation, coronation war seemed to signal ominous times. His five-year reign was marked by failures and defeat. Tlacaelet, still minister of state, and Tisok's brother, General Awisapu, conspired together to have the king poisoned in order to preserve their people and stave off destruction. But basically, they had they basically had Trump as their <laughs> <laughs> no. And yeah, the Mexica didn't mess around. They, they they handled things differently than we do now. With Tisok out of the way, the 88-year-old Tlacaelet prepared to submit Awisapu's name to the city leadership. But he was first approached by alliance of leaders, including Nezahualpili, son of Nezahualcoyot. They begged Lacaele to assume the kingship himself. And this is what he said, it's really fantastic. My sons, I certainly thank you and the king of Texcoco for coming here before me. But I want you to tell me, in the nearly 90 years I have been on this earth, during all this time since the defeat of Azcapotzalco, what have I been? What position have I held? Have I been nothing then? Do you wonder why I never placed a crown on my head or used the royal insignias that are the want of kings? Come, do you not understand the value of all that I have judged and ordained? Do you believe I unjustly put criminals to death and pardon the innocent? Lords were made and unmade at my command. Do you believe I have broken the laws of this kingdom wearing jewels and clothes and sandals only permitted to kings? I have dressed in the robes and masks of gods. With these hands, I have lifted the sacrificial blade and spilled blood like Nsilopochli himself. And if I do these things and have done them for nearly a century, huh, then king I am and king I have always been. What more of a king would you have me be? The nobles bowed their heads and accepted his recommendation of Awizatu whose reign would renew the Triple Alliance and vastly expand its borders. Yet, though Tlacaela had refused the throne, his people crowned him with an unheard of glory when he died a year after Awisapu's coronation. They wept for months at his passing, crying out a new title, one never used before or since. They called him In Semanawak Tepewani, Master of the Sea Green World. Basically saying, he was the emperor of the planet. <laughs> it's pretty freaking awesome, man. He's cool. <laughs> title, I mean, that sounds, it kind of seems like what Putin is going for, and he's like, <laughs> emperor of planet Earth, that you see like his new, look at my massive new weapons that can blow the United States off the face of the planet. <laughs> Remember my name, guys. Adam <laughs> Putin. Crazy guy. Crazy, crazy guy. Almost as crazy as our president. Okay, um, sorry. Those of you who are Trump supporters, please accept my apology. <laughs> the last section is conquest and change. And this is 
uh, like a really, really tough section because here we have like the ending of the Mexico that was. Um, the different sections are the, the convocation um, and then Malignali and the coming of Cortez, which is all about the woman that we now call Malinche, um, who we mistakenly malign as a traitor. She was not a traitor. She wasn't even an Aztec. Yes, ma'am. Erendida, that's the spider woman, isn't it? No, no. Oh, is that a different and, one? Uh, I'm going to read a, a teensy bit at the end of it. I didn't need the story. Is uh, Purepecha Princess. Oh. Okay. And then um, the anguish of Sintlali is the origin of the of the Yorona story. She's the first Yorona. She was given, and she was a princess of Xochimilco who was given in marriage to a, a captain, uh, a Spanish captain. Um, and that, that's just a fascinating story. They, and so she moved up today, they still put on every year like this like incredible, if you ever are down there around the time of the Day of the Dead, you'll see this thing. They put on this fantastic musical presentation, the story of Steve Lally, um, the, the original Yorona, um, and then edited in the Donati. So this, this section, in the midst of all the destruction that's happening, I focus a lot on how women are like the, the last, they make the last stand. There's the, they're the ones who push back and resist until the very, very end. Um, but I want to read the complication of this section because it um, it's where I kind of like spell out to the reader what I hope is accomplished by reading all, through all this. And then I'll read like, this is the very end of I didn't need a story in. And uh, we'll close up shop and take questions. How can we weave the tale of Tenochtitlan's fall, sisters and brothers? How can we sing those anguished cries? Such an epic tragedy could fill book after book with sorrow. Let us sketch the shape of the conquest with smoke and ash. Let, uh, let the end of the, of the Mexica be a silhouette against the burning burrows, the funeral pyres, the bonfires fed with painted books. Do you tremble, friends? Do you weep here beside me? On the battleground, littered with indigenous dead, it appears that chaos has won. The Nahuas called Tezcatlipoca, known as Hurricane to the Ancients, the enemy of both sides. You may see that dark god's hand at work in the destruction of Mesoamerica. The Spanish pit nation against nation. Old rivalries heighten the destructive power of firearms, foreign disease, Toledo steel. Death spreads, conquers, reigns. All seems lost. But here we stand, do we not? A testament to the triumph of order and creation. Much was torn down, many lives obliterated, many words erased, yet something new would be built. A new hybrid people would emerge. A valiant and enduring tongue would be forged in the crucible of oppression. Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, proud inheritors of this fifth son. And if you look closely, at our palimpsest souls, you can see the ghostly tracings of all we ever were, indelible if faint, ready to be read again by open hearts and minds, ready to be emblazoned on banners like the incomparable features of Princess Donaji, on seals like the noble profile of Emperor Cuauhtémoc, in paintings like Erendia upon her rearing steed. We are their descendants heirs to their unyielding souls. These final stories are ours. Mestizo missives and manuscripts and music. We wrote them down, recited them, shared them mind to mind. They live on in our histories, in our poetry, on our lips, in our hearts. And we will never forget. So, it ended up the last the last person to stand against the Spanish, stole a horse, killed a Spanish conquistador, stole his horse. Everybody else was afraid of these beasts. She tamed it. She learned how to, to, to tame and master a horse, learned how to ride it. And then she led groups of Purepecha warriors. Purepecha are the indigenous people of Michoacan. Led them to steal more horses. She trained warriors of her nation how to ride, and they they fought against the Spanish in like one final battle, but she was betrayed by the warrior who loved her, who was kind of a coward, 
and wasn't willing to like throw himself into battle. And so at, at the very end, he's turned against his people, um, which turns the tide and the Spanish um, and the Flash Calans who are coming to, to, take, to, to take the city are destroying everything. And so there's a final scene where her um, estranged would-be lover is, uh, and she had this confrontation. I'll read it to you and then I'll open up to questions and I'll give some copies of the book away. The cries of survivors came from the temple. To Captain Deolid's surprise, a group of warriors rushed into its interior, attacking with cruelty the surviving rebels within. This was the remnant of Nanuma's army. Nanuma is the man, I, the coward that I was referring to, whom he had ordered in fierce tones to have mercy on no one. His hate had one objective to find Erendira and then humiliate or harm her. He shouted her name in a maddened voice that blended with the screams of terror and pain. No answer came. His wild, searching eyes scoured the victims to no avail. Erendira was not among them. One by one, Nanuma and his men slaughtered their surviving brothers, ignoring outstretched hands and pleas for compassion. Among the wounded was old Timas, this is Erendira's father, his blood watering the soil that he so loved. Stepping with indifferent cruelty on the corpses of his kin, Nanuma rushed to the father of the woman he despised, his obsidian sword raised to strike. Then, bursting through the doors on her white stallion, came Erendira, hurtling toward the traitor with a scream of righteous fury on her lips. The hooves of that horse were her weapons, and she used them with deadly precision to obliterate the shameful coward to whom she had once promised her heart. Dismounting, and Indida went to her father's side as he trembled in his final moments. Be ever true to yourself, dear child, he breathed. Michoacan awaits you with open arms. Let no man be your master. Closing his eyes with a steady hand, and Indida leapt on her stallion and spurred it out of the temple, past the startled Spaniards, through the city gates, and into the distant hills. Horse and rider disappeared within the forest. And then that was never seen again. So, powerful stories of, of the rise and the fall and the resistance of Mesoamerica. And uh, something that I hope that you guys, if you pick up a copy of it, uh, and next month when it comes out, will really enjoy it.